Hey, well, thank you, Aaron. Uh, and thank you everybody for um, all the great uh, insights and discussion. And so actually uh, Judy and my role here, we really wanna facilitate further discussion and kind of to come together with your input uh, for some specific ideas and recommendations. And, um, and thank you to Aaron for actually, uh, and HGRS staff for actually taking notes throughout the meeting. So if they've sent that to us and I've summarized a few key points. So if I may, I'm gonna to try to share my screen for some of the recurring themes I noticed in the notes. So some of the uh, themes I'm just gonna, you know, uh, sort of elaborate a little bit. And so first is that we've heard a lot about sort of the value of the multi-omic data. Uh, there's a lot in, in their value in, in several ways. There is the ability to really interpret, for, for example, potentially uh, non-coding variants that might affect, uh, if that occurs, for example, for, you know, the, there are the vast majority of GWAS hits. Uh, so they are causes of disease and we might understand them better if they're not in protein coding genes. And there's also the capacity to capture information that has to do with the environment, exposures and so going beyond the genome. So there's a lot of value there. Uh, a couple of the, several of the comments relate to the fact that a lot of the current uh, multi-omic studies, if they're from blood or they're from some sort of bulk tissue, they do not get to the uh, potentially the, the pathogenic cell. We heard uh, from Sarah, beautiful presentation about how single cell information can really uh, give us an opportunity to get at uh, these rare pathogenic cells. So potentially one area of uh, future continued technological development that NHGRI may support uh, is technologies for single cell multiomics, uh, capturing all these kinds of information uh, from the same cell, uh, potentially even with spatial context. A second sort of theme that came up was the, uh, the really the, the value for longitudinal data uh, beyond case control studies. Um, Mike talked about, uh, Snyder talked about uh, longitudinal imaging, longitudinal information, get information about trajectories, and you, only, you need multiple uh, measurements from the same individual. And uh, those kinds of studies are inherently powerful because the other time points serve as controls uh, for uh, the disease process uh, for that person. Uh, a lot of these studies are mostly done in blood. So the question is, can we go beyond sampling from blood? And so then you have to think about what other samples are frequently collected, uh, acquired from our patient populations. Some of those are gonna exist in FFPE. That's gonna be the vast majority of the state that these samples are stored in. So then perhaps if you wanna say, just push on the technological front, we would have to make our uh, multiomics or single cell multiomic methods work with FFPE and, uh, uh, or, uh, or some others from the common, maybe solid tissue samples, which has some different kind of technological challenges compared to blood. Um, a third theme uh, relates to computational methods to harmonize and integrate uh, all this very rich data. Uh, there's a lot of actually work that needs to be done there for standardization and, and, and gaining insight. And finally, we heard a lot about phenome data. This is really the most perhaps uh, very most interesting and challenging aspect. There's a lot of information in EHR. How can we explore uh, these records from electronic uh, um, uh, medical records without um, either missing information or compromising privacy? Uh, is there a need for some sort of uh, further level annotation? How's that gonna be uh, uh, pay for? And also sharing this data. And I personally can imagine that NHGRI's uh, position and perhaps policy on this could really be important in setting the trend. So these are some of the um, sort of themes that has come up. And um, so let me, let, let's open this up now for everybody to kind of chime in, either you agree or disagree with these points or you wanna add more. Uh, so uh, please raise your hand or post uh, questions uh, in the chat. Sarah. Hi, Howard, thanks. Um... So, so I think all of those make sense. I mean, do you, they're, they're, they're sort of infra or technological and infrastructural things that I think we can all agree on, you know, or, or, you know, fairly uncontroversial. Like, is it, is it, you know, you're a clinician. So would you say that there should be a focus on particular diseases? Um, or are you looking at this more like a population-based kind of, you know, phenome data, EHR annotation, set sharing, and so on. I mean, how, 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 is, how should we think about this? How should we prioritize populations to, you know, cohorts, cohorts? Right. I mean, the, 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 so yeah, so that, that's a very, so you asked some really broad questions. I think that there's most likely that 
that the multi-nomic technologies what we've heard is really broadly applicable to many kinds of diseases, right? Broadly to the phenomenon of aging. We heard a lot of studies about Alzheimer's, heart disease, even neuropsychiatric disease. So I don't think we should pigeonhole this technology as being applicable to a certain disease. My own work is in the area of cancer and there's a lot of great applications. No, I completely, there. I completely agree with that. But I think there are, you know, not being a clinician, I think there's something like 22,000 like registered disease terms or something like that. And it's right. you know not financially feasible to kind of address every single one. So how to, I mean, aging is I think something that everyone can agree on is important, you know, as we age, but beyond, beyond that kind of, is there, is there a way of prioritizing like areas of unmet need or, or where, where can, let's say single cell multiomics, you know, or, you know, FFP kind of spatial technologies have the biggest impact in your opinion or anybody else from a clinical point of view. Right. I think that with any new technology, you have to meet kind of medicine where it's at, right? So basically then if you're thinking that, so these multi-omic methods we're talking about, they require uh, some access to patients' cells, right? Like maybe something in the future, patients just have to breathe on something or spit on something and you can get multi-omic data. But at the moment, we still need access to, to the cell. So then it, it, the kind of clinical practice where they're constantly taking samples of the tissues of interest, that's the place where this technology can right. immediately start yeah, to get that, adopted that, that, and that's, tested. That's a practical answer. Yeah, that's a practical answer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, I see a question from, is this Eric? I cannot see that name. Sorry about that. Uh, I see a hand that's raised. Please go ahead. Oh. Hi, this is uh, Phil Diego. Okay, sorry. No, no problems. I mean, I think the, uh, again, I think what we need, we need to do more, I think, is understanding the healthy variation, well, the variation among healthy uh, individuals, in particular biological rhythms, you know, which affect all these measurements, whether it's seasonal, diurnal, you know, menstrual and other cycles, which are for many dimensions, you know, are not well understood, especially at a single cell level. And we're beginning to explore this, you know, through the, the um, the HCA and, and other efforts. But again, I think we probably need to do this at a larger scale and uh, to really get the, the full diversity, you know, of the human population in terms of these rhythms and also effects of the, the environment. And again, I think some of the existing cohorts have done some of this, but, uh, but I think we need maybe to do some more structured sampling to really sort of get a good baseline uh, on variation. Great, thank you. I have a comment or a question about folks who work with EHR data, because I, I can imagine that the, um, the, the clinical annotation for a lot of these things is basically maybe different research groups have different kinds of, of scales and different descriptions. So it's very hard then to basically uh, compare across multiple studies. Uh, and so how do you deal with that in EHR data? Can you, for example, export the ICD-9 codes that are associated with individuals uh, from your study? ICD-9 codes are insurance billing codes that are obviously used uh, sort of, of course, in the U.S. that would all be in common. And so is that feasible? Is that allowed? Uh, I would love to hear from people who have more uh, 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 experience with this. Uh, Craig, you have a comment. Let me stop yeah, so I can so, see everybody. Um, so the big comment I have is um, a lot of our effort right now is part of this Orion network is spent with clinical abstraction specialists who have to go into the EHR and structure it. It's the biggest effort that we have right now. So I would love a magical solution, but right now it's just paying somebody to do it manually. And um, we have 600 patients we're going through right now. It's like, you know, maybe 20, 30 patients a week at best. What, what exactly is your annotation team doing? Like explain for to us a little bit, like what is actually happening? So they're looking at what drugs are given, but they also have to understand the context a little bit. So this is um, a cancer um, tumor registry type person who's going in and seeing, were they given a therapy? Did they go on an immune blocker? And so some of the data is structured, but some of the data isn't. And so there may be former nurses or so forth who can go in and put it from the EHR into REDCap based on a framework that was defined by our consortium. Orion is one of these networks and it's funded by a private group, but basically we have 600 fields that we fill out and it's all of the things that a consortium did. And so they just do it manually. It can be a lot of things. 
a tool and then Nancy. Yeah, so uh, as you know, ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes are pretty arbitrary. Uh, the codes themselves are, they seem so perfect, but it all depends on the billing folks and what, you know, what they bill under that. Um, so uh, the docs themselves, right, we, we obviously have docs go between hospitals all the time. We never retrain them, right, to know a disease is called this here and that there. So they usually mean the same thing. But it's important to note that they're used for billing. Obviously, a lot of the meat of a phenotype, let's say the number of joints affected by this or the number of that affected by that are in the text notes. And indeed, you can use concept identification to try, try to extract stuff, which is crude and has a long way to go, a lot more fundable science possible there. Uh, but otherwise, you hire curators. And that's what some of these companies are doing, right? Flatiron has 500 curators. Tempest has 500 plus curators. Um, that's how they really get the phenotypes. I just put in the chat there this thing called uh, FKB, which I think comes out of Vanderbilt and many others, which are just heuristics or algorithms. You know, if you see rheumatoid arthritis coded three times and you see a this, then call it rheumatoid arthritis. So it's a crude way that's been empirically validated to go from EHR data to phenotypes, let's say from the genetics point of view, but it's just a start and I don't even think they get funding. They should probably. I'll just shut up now. So, so, so if I may follow up on that point, right? So, so, okay. So once you have this, basically these 500 uh, sort of, you know, curators going through and reading all these charts, and then let's say this group of report publishes the paper, is there also a, a data matrix of all the phenotype table, right? Or is that somehow like the disappears so that nobody can get access to that? I mean, in my experience, when the companies do it, of course, they don't want to release yeah. that. I mean, that is their killer secret sauce advantage, right? Right. I mean, um, it put a lot of resource into that. Yeah, well, exactly. And that's the point. Like, we have 100 curators. I think it, if you probably counted them all up across Orion at the different sites, and it's funded by pharma, and then we have the academic rights to publish. But at the end of the day, there's so many restrictions. It would be great to see more publications from it. It's a different source of money. So it'd be good to have the public part force that data out some way. That's where those public private partnerships could maybe help. Okay, hey, Nancy, you've been very patient. No, I just say there, there are, there's a whole, um, a whole literature on this. You know, you you go if you, you know, look at electronic health re records um, literature. The very active science in this area, and the algorithms, yes, it can be validated with you know, sort of physician standard gold reference, but. Just a reminder, physician standard platinum reference, whatever you want to call, it, it's not truth. It's all data. We have to we have to learn how to get to truth with the data that we have. And the it's often the case that the physician gold standard diagnosis wants data that don't exist in EHRs. So I mean that's that's just what we have to live with. EHR data is um, complicated relative to research quality data, but it's the data that we have to do all the translation in. So, so we just need to swallow the bitter pill and use it because this is all we will ever have for doing translation. And so we need to learn to work with it, learn to find our signals in this quality data interpret everything in this quality data and and take it forward because this is all we will ever have for translation. So we we do need in some sense to get to, to really translate our research findings to this space because this is where we have to translate it. And yeah, it's kind of messy. Some phenotypes, I mean, you, Crohn's disease is actually really good in EHRs if you've got four or five diagnoses, billing codes in some period of time. It's an outstandingly high quality diagnosis. But you look at something like type one or type two diabetes and it sucks. That you're asking physicians to make a distinction between types of diabetes that, that they don't have any of the research quality data that we use all the time for making those distinctions. So. It's a really disease by disease variation. A lot of algorithms can work that involve, you know, checking for drugs, checking for 
certain kinds of procedures that are common within a, a particular diagnosis and and text mining for negation, you know, rule out kinds of diagnoses. There's, there's all kinds of tricks to this. There's also now perfectly, really outstanding quantitative probability cloud level diagnoses made with the whole set of diagnoses. So, so you get a probability distribution over many possible diagnoses instead of, um, instead of just a single diagnosis. And that's real world too. So I, I think it's not a question of, of either or. We have to do this. We have to learn how to translate our research findings to this quality of information because this is where, this is the only place we're ever going to translate anything. Great. Thank you, Nancy. So Achua had a comment in the chat, so I'm going to put him on the spot for a moment. Um, so Achua, if you can talk about then, so what, what, what are the gaps? What are the needs, right? Because you've been trying to do this, for example, within the UC, University, University of California healthcare system. So if you have a patient that you've done sequencing, you've done some molecular studies, and that patient's going back and forth between UCSF and UC Davis, is that is that okay? Like, do all these hospital records talk to each other or they have to keep coming back to the same site, to the mothership, otherwise the information is somehow corrupted? Yeah, so we, we have a centralized database of all patient care data across the entire University of California. So all six academic medical centers, that's uh, synced up every two weeks. So we take all that data. We started with Federated, a lot of discussion that chat about Federated, which is great. I2B2 is a software a lot of people use, or the companies launched on that as well. But Federated only got us so far. We were using I2B2 for more than 10 years. Yes, you can count patients, but right away you want the actual data on those patients. Then you got to go chase down someone to get, get it for you. And so Federated just stalls right away. So that's why we, we moved to Central uh, when I left Stanford, right, five years ago. Uh, so, but uh, Howard, if you ask me if someone goes between Sutter, our competitor, and UCSF, then of course we don't have the Sutter records in there, right? And they don't have ours. Of course, the clinicians can see that for patient care purposes, they happen to both be on Epic, but that isn't allowed for research purposes, right? So th there's all sorts of subtleties here, but um, you know, a huge plus 100 for what Nancy is saying, right? A lot depends on, uh, you know, people say all the time, electronic health record data is messy data. I, I completely dispute it. Medical care is a messy world. The EHR captures that mess really well, right? It's not because it's the EHR's fault. Med medicine is messy, right? Who's actually rendering the phenotype? Is this a rheumatoid arthritis specialist who's seen that, you know, these kinds of cases for 20 years? Or is this a primary care doc who just graduated from residency? This is their first case, right? Um, yes, there's a nice pristine ICD-10 code behind both of them, right? What does it actually mean? So we're going to have to deal with that world. That world isn't going to get any prettier, but algorithms, et cetera, et cetera, are going to have to work within that world. I don't know if that answers your question, Howard. Yeah, we've had some good discussions on electronic health record. Let me just ask one last question on the EHR. I mean, it fundamentally has to do with touches to the health system that Neil Hanchard is asking about, which is, you know, once you get past 50, you're going to have much more intensive health care. Uh, but we think that a lot of health is determined by what ha happens during pediatrics and childhood. Does anyone want to comment? Because, you know, we want, to, we want to get beyond the EHR discussion, which is obviously an important one. Anyone want to comment on, are we, are we calculating, how are we seeing touches for the first 20, 25 years of life from Neil? I don't know if Neil's going to answer. I'm technically a pediatrician as well. Uh, oh, how I think... Uh, I th oh, how I wish, I think our, our field wishes we were that relevant. Um, uh, because I think, um, you know, the average pediatrician probably sees a kid maybe every 18 months, right? A couple maybe in their teen years, maybe once every other year, and then that's it. So maybe a total of six encounters. Um, yeah, I would probably say that, uh, you know, uh, bad health in childhood probably leads to worse health as an adult. But, um, you know, that kind of uh, life course kind of science is really tough to get funded and we know what happened to national children's study and all the rest, right? So I don't even know what else to say there. So I, I, I was kind of asking it in a, I was actually asking it in an EHR, which is that, you know, are the tools and so on that are built for adults, you know, will they, will they work if you wanted to do something in the pediatric EHR? So, you know, like we work on early onset hypertension, but it has a very different categorization of 
than in adults, right? So, you know, are are those tools available? I I, I doubt they're really generally available at all. So I think TKBs, my that's one that I put in the chat. I think it tends to be a little, a little uh, adult oriented. I think the pediatric side of it is much harder, probably much more captured in the notes, right? You're looking at an echo and you're still looking for one field of an echo, perhaps, you know, partial pressure over something. So it's gonna need a lot more text notes and parsing. So I bet um, that that science and engineering still has to be developed. All right, Mike Snyder has a comment. He has his, his hands up. Yeah, I mean, just picking up on the, the pediatric stuff, I, I, I think it's really cool and it really needs to be done, but you're right, our system's not set up to do it because, but, but it's so important because as a, you know, nutrition in the first few years of life basically imprints you for life. And we don't know how many other things are like that, quite frankly, but probably behavioral stuff, the whole neurological side, I think is super cool during, right, all the childhood years. So we really should be capturing that information. You need a long-term Teddy kind of view on this whole thing where you start, you know, preconception and go, well, till people die. And I, I know that was proposed and got trash, but at some flavor of it should get resurrected again. If nothing else, save the samples. I think we'd learn a ton. Don't forget to bring in mental health around it. Nothing more formative than those teenage years for mental health. Mike, so, so let me just ask, go ahead. I'm sorry, Judy. go ahead, Howard. Oh, just an, another question, just to, to switch from the EHR. We've had a lot of good discussions in the EHR, but um, what do people think about the multi-omic? This is the theme of the, of the workshop. We've talked, I mean, is there a need for additional methodology? What are the, if people were to say, okay, we need to, we have all these great data sets, we want to analyze them. What do people think in terms of the analytic methodology piece? Needed? Priority? Uh, so uh, I would say that uh, working in this space, I would say definitely the answer is yes, because I think that there are still many... Um, we talked about, uh, there's still a couple of different flavors, right? There's the multi-omics aspect, like how many different modalities can capture at the same time. The common ones now being, for example, DNA sequence or chromatin and RNA, now increasingly also protein. But I think combining that with metabolomic measurements, which is not yet sort of standardly done at the same time or from the same sample, that, that's one aspect. The second aspect is, you know, can you do that all at the, at the same single cell? Okay, if you're talking about single cell level, or uh, so then then going deep there. The third level then is how many single cells can you capture? Because if you're talking about rare pathogenic cells, if that cell is one in a hundred, then how many cells do you have to sequence through to, to see that? Right? Let's say it's the brain, it's the microglia. You have to sequence through many many cells. So what is your throughput and what's your cost? And remember, we have to do that across multiple samples and multiple individuals. And so there's still a lot of uh, of technological challenges, right? So all these aspects people are working on and uh, one does not negate the other, right? Like the, 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 you want to kind of get better in, in all dimensions. Yeah. And uh, Jonathan, you have a comment. Jonathan, you might be muted. Uh, sorry. Um, I was just going to follow up on what Howard Howard was saying, and it's absolutely critical that we have the methodologies and that we continue to work on the methodologies. I would put it in slightly different, maybe put a slightly different view on it. There are really two two things that we need to have those uh, technologies, the, the methodologies worked on. One is integrating the different omics on the same samples, right? Whether that's single cell, whether that's tissue, whether, you know, whatever it is, you need to, we need to be able to do that. There are, you know, people are working on this, but there, there's just a tremendous amount of, of progress that needs to be made there. Then there's the other aspect the, of trying to integrate the multi-omics across different samples, right? So some of the omics is done on one type of sample. Some of the omics, other omics is done on other samples. You can learn, information from one, you know, from each of those, and you need to figure out, we need to figure out how to best integrate all of that. And I think that's, you know, this where you, is where you get into the computational aspects of things, the deep learning, the machine learning, things like that. Uh, but that's absolutely critical. And there's a lot that needs to be done there. That's a good way to think about it. Uh, Nathan? 
Yeah, I agree with all the things that have already been said, but I think there's some really interesting challenges that come when you're doing data on dense multiomics. And one of those is that sometimes when you're designing studies, and I've been in many of these kind of debates, people start saying, oh, you shouldn't make all these measurements because you're going to have too many variables and therefore we're, you know, you're going to have too many multiple hypotheses and we're not going to learn anything. And my point of view is that that is a very backwards way to think about things. It's true if all you're going to do is feed data through a matrix and run an analysis on a, on a, on a matrix, right? Variables versus samples. You can't argue with that exactly. But it's a very odd place to be to say that the more we, under, the more we measure about this patient, the less we're able to understand about them. That's, in my mind, a very backward. If, if, if that's true, then we're doing something wrong. So what we really need to develop around multiomics and this dense information is that you can dive in. And one, making more measurements does not only mag amplify your, um, your error, right? Your, your multiple hypothesis. It also error corrects. Because if you have one measure, right, and it jumps out, and you, if you make a small handful of measures and you see one jump out, you don't know if that's a measurement error. You don't know if it's an anomaly. You don't know if it matters. But if you have a bunch of measures and you know what, understand a process, you can see that if this measure jumps out into some really unusual space, well, are all the things connected to it? Did they get pulled on? Were they perturbed? Did they change? Like you can error correct a lot. So that's one element. A second is that we really need to be able to analyze on an N of one basis, what is happening in a particular patient. So one of the issues there, and I think Phil brought it up, we have to understand the wellness space in detail uh, and so that we can look, and you can do this on an N of one basis, we do this a lot, where you can then take a person's measurement, compare it against the wellness state, and then <clears throat> monitor. Here's everything that's really highly unusual. It's really weird for this protein to be 10 times higher than this other protein, or it's really odd for you know, these metabolites to be in this state or whatever it is. And now there's these huge efforts through uh, Google's doing a huge effort on this, uh, NCATS is doing a big effort on this, but building these massive knowledge graphs where we can actually come in and say, all right, let's, if we have a density of information, especially if it's longitudinal on a particular person, and we have enough population to know what wellness looks like, you can then dive in and look at a very personalized trajectory. We're, we're just launching a big uh, clinical trial in pregnancy to do this uh, in that space. But basically, you can dive in and look on these individual trajectories. And, and that's pretty nascent. And yet, it's one of the huge opportunities for analytics in, in the multiomic space. Not to diminish any of the other ones we've talked about, but that's a big one. And it's not focused on that much right now. And I think it's, it's really important. Thank you, Nathan. Um, I think let's well, spend the last half. Uh, we're, we've been charged with recommendations to NHGRI, but before we go to that, um, one of the important stakeholders are obviously uh, journals. So Tiago has agreed to make a few comments. Um, thank you. Hi. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Tiago. I'm an editor at Nature Genetics. Uh, and I would really like to thank Howard, Judy, Joanella for the opportunity to participate, not just in the workshop, but also to give a, 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 you know, a short editorial perspective. Um, so um, some of the points that I would like to mention have already, I guess, been uh, uh, alluded to. I just want to emphasize a few things. Uh, I think from an editorial perspective, uh, and we're getting more and more submissions, uh, more papers that use multiomics, um, I think from a science communication perspective, um, the feed, you know, what we see and the feedback that we get often from reviewers, meaning you uh, from the community, uh, is that uh, it's, these data sets are usually quite overwhelming. And to actually be able to distill and extract meaningful biology from these data sets is still extremely uh, challenging. Um, I think that it derives partly from how papers are written, how the science is communicated, but I think it also has to do a lot with uh, the, the, the really dire need, I think, for, very, for more refined analytical tools. Uh, I think we definitely need, uh, I think the community should, I think in my perspective, uh, invest a lot in developing new tools that can really integrate uh, all these data sites, uh, also, 
I think benchmarking was something that was mentioned very briefly, and I cannot emphasize how important that is. Uh, but I think uh, there should be really a lot of investment made in developing new tools that can not just, and, and, and when I mean tools to integrate these data, it's not just from a sort of uh, perspective of computational efficiency or statistical soundness, but actually to be able to extract biological meaning uh, and mechanism from, from these data sets. And I know this is, you know, easy, very easily said and, you know, it's harder to do it, but I think that's a point that I would like to emphasize that I would you know, like to encourage people in the field to really invest in, in creating more tools. Um, the other point I wanted to mention, it's already been talked about is the diversity uh, basically uh, that we desperately need, I think, to include uh, samples from different populations, from different ancestries. Uh, I think Tuli mentioned that, you know, in the GWAS space, this is already being done, but I think in the functional or multiomic space, this is in my, from my perspective, still lagging behind. So I would encourage everybody to as much as possible to try and include uh, patients and samples from uh, individuals from different um, backgrounds, different ancestry groups. Uh, and I understand that there are challenges there that are socioeconomic, you know, et cetera, but I think it's, it, it's really, really important. And um, last, but perhaps not least, I would like to uh, be a bit provocative and play devil's advocate here, not to sound, you know, like a curmudgeon, but basically to hopefully uh, trigger some discussion and some thought, which is, um, I am routinely seeing more and more studies that I feel, and the reviewers feel as well, that are performing multiomics because they can and not because they should. And the point being that, um, and I, and I, th I think this is a, a natural a risk or caveat with any emerging technology, which is, you know, you feel that it's trendy, you feel that this is where the field is going, the funders sort of require or expect this, et cetera, et cetera. And you go ahead and do this. Uh, and then in the end, you've invested a lot of time and money and you don't necessarily understand the disease better or come out, you know, get anything meaningful out of it. And again, I'm not saying, I'm, you know, because I do, I am a believer in the power of multiomics. I'm just throwing this, you know, back to the community to say that I think it is extremely, extremely important to think about what is it that you're trying to address? What is the, the question that you're trying to answer? I already mentioned you know, earlier that there's, I think there, there are, even though they're not mutually exclusive, there are uh, very significant differences in, in how you should design your study if you're basically just trying to identify biomarkers of disease progression versus if you're really trying to understand disease etiology or the mechanisms that underlie, uh, you know, uh, pathogenesis. Um, and I, I think it isn't really important to think about this, to consider this, um, because I often see uh, papers looking at, you know, it's, it's sometimes like see like huge efforts of people doing bulk tissue, multiomic approaches, and the tissue is not relevant for the disease. At the end, you cannot really explain all the correlations or anti-correlations that you see, and you're none the wiser. And uh, it's in some cases, it would be more informative just to do one or two omics technologies, for example, but at the single cell uh, level and using relative relevant tissues or cells. And I think it would be way more important. So this is just a challenge that I would uh, uh, lay out, which is, you know, think very carefully what technologies you need to use to address the questions that you want to answer. Uh, think very carefully whether you need single cell resolution or, or bulk is, is enough, but don't just do multiomics because it's something trendy or it's something that you think that you ought to be doing because of you know, where, the where the field is, is heading. Uh, so yeah, so having said that, I think those are the only three points that I'd like to emphasize. So basically more need for analytical tools, more diversity, uh, and uh, careful study design and technology application. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's terrific. So for the remaining time, you know, our charge really is to provide recommendations to NHGRI. 
uh, they're all on the line or many of them are on the line. Um, so again, we just open it up to the floor. And Great. Judy, we, we thought maybe we could put up, Joan, Joan Ellis has been capturing some of what we heard, maybe put that on the screen, let people look at it and then weigh in and see if there's anything uh, that we missed. Does that sound good? Sounds great. Okay. Can you all see Joan Ellis' screen? Yeah. Is it yes. big enough? Okay. So the recommendations that we have captured at the moment are listed here. Should we go through them one by one or can people see and offer? Um, maybe you could just add session five so it's on the next page so we can just be seeing oh. one fell yep. swoop there. Makes sense. There you go, perfect. There you go. I don't know if the first point is is uh, related to what uh, the point that I raised about integrating data from multi omics cohort studies with multi omic sort of experimental perturbation studies. I don't know if if clarifying that might be. Uh, okay. Make it clearer. Sorry, I'm. Okay. And uh, Terry, you have a, a question or comment? Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, oh, I need to turn on my camera, although you don't want to see me. But um, but at any rate, on the um, studying variation among healthy individuals, uh, kind of a challenge. Uh, while we need to understand variation that's within health, sometimes there's not a lot of it that relates to disease. And so, so can, maybe we could get some, some suggestions for how to balance, you know, comparing health and disease or what kind of diseased individuals to look at. We talked earlier about um, people with exacerbating remaining illnesses. Um, Judy showed some really nice data on, on that. So, so what do people think about um, uh, how do we balance that to, to get the most bang for the buck? Well, my, my reflex, Terry, is that, you know, we've, we've had a couple of multiple people saying that transition from health to disease. Uh, sure. How do we capture that? Yeah, so, so having spent 20 years in cardiovascular epidemiology, um, it takes a long time to go from health to disease, and you have to study thousands and tens of thousands of people, um, you know, unless you catch them at right, just the right moment, and you don't know when that is. So, so if there are, are suggestions for how, you know, who might be in a transition, um, that would be helpful. So maybe to respond to well, that, I mean, the, this is Phil Zwickson, I made the original point, but I think actually we've seen in the, in the brain, for example, although this is autopsy material, that um, the, um, that about five to 10% of the transcriptome varies with seasonally, you know, in the brain. And so I think it's actually, we don't need large numbers to actually measure a lot of these biological variability, these biological rhythms. And then they will be able, enable us to, you know, adjust, you know, the measurements that we do to account for this variability that otherwise can get confounded because of our sampling scheme. So I, actually, I would, I would, you know, I would definitely sort of think that with a few hundred su subjects carefully, you know, characterized, I think we could go a long way, particularly, you know, with uh, more diverse populations. Uh, Mike, you had a comment. Yeah, well, I guess to add the last one, Terry's point, certainly um, to uh, go after at-risk groups certainly increases your probability. But I think we need it just on basic health, healthy individuals. And if you think about kids, again, there's incredible transitions going through, again, preconception all the way through probably the 20. Uh, there's just a lot going on. It's very hard if any of you have ever done kids' studies to compare a disease kid 
with a healthy kid. There's just not good reference data sets out for healthy kids. It's really a mess. Um, so I, I think this you do need the healthy cohorts, period. And then at some frequency, you will get, um, you know, people who do get disease. I originally raised my hand because I also, it's sort of implied here, but I think these longitudinal studies, I, I, I think you can't, it's there in the life course uh, situation, but it goes beyond life course. Longitudinal studies are extremely powerful. <clears throat> right. Uh, Neil, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was, I was, I was actually originally going to comment about this, this idea about like how do you, how do you get the transition from health and disease? Um, and someone said earlier that you know taking those who are at high risk, and you know, arguably, there are, there are certainly Mendelian diseases where you know you you know that there's a certain risk involved there, and may, maybe those would be good, you know sort of starting points as to ones where you think that you might be able to see changes that occur. And so that's, that's certainly one argument. I was also going to second Mike's argument, which is entirely selfish, but this, this idea about, we don't know anything about like molecular puberty or like, you know, birth changes or any of these kinds of things, which can be um, also, also really important. Um, and I did also, as a last point, want to emphasize what people had said about, is there a way to harmonize what's already there? There's a lot of that in the chat. Um, and, you know, be able to utilize that in a, in a more sort of reference way, rather than just kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, Caroline. Yeah, I I think actually the two main things I was going to talk about got captured, which are sort of things in the chat and the meeting overall that don't seem to be in these recommendations, is this sort of harmonization as part of the integration need and then the um, diversity, although that's already been added as a sub bullet since I raised my hand, but those when I was just reading them as they were there were sort of striking in how they didn't match with what we've been hearing all day in terms of these recommendations. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Allison? I, I just wanted to suggest in the healthy groups, healthy aging, right? Really the old, old, oldest old who are healthy uh, overall uh, are gonna be helpful in thinking about protective factors for, again, against all diseases, but I you know understanding, I think we all would like to age healthily. Right? So uh, we all should have a vested interest in that one. I, I agree, Allison. Is there like a centenarian study out there? I mean, there stuff? are, yes. I don't know whether people are doing proteomic, you know, doing a multiomics in them, but those would be cohorts, right? Centenarians were uh, maybe valuable information. Mike is being negative and saying you're, it's just inevitable before you transition to disease. There is no such thing as healthy aging. <laughs> well, you get two birds with one stone. You, see, you, <laughs> you get aging and then you also get transitions to disease. Uh, the IPOP study is a great example of that. And I think Nathan's work as well. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we've had some discussions about feasibility and efforts that have failed in the past versus what we really need to do. What I'm hearing is kids are hard, but important. And so, um, you know, it really is, you know, it's a time of enormous transition and change. We want to talk about transitions, so. Uh, Atul, you have your hand up. Yeah. Uh, just suggestion you uh, you can um, uh, ignore it if you want, but I, I would put as a specific recommendation to take more advantage of the all of us research cohort. It's my perception that some of the tests uh, that were taken off the table were solely due to funding. Uh, one could imagine more immunology measurements, more methylation measurements, more single cell you know, uh, measurements if there were more funding there. And the samples are there, the electronic health record data is there, they're using Fitbits, they're connected with smartphones, and it's a 10-year study. 
So I would specifically put the All of Us Research Court as a recommendation. I agree. Nathan? Or uh, uh, I forget who was first. Rachel, and then Nathan, and then Tess. Um, I was just going to say, I think as well as, um, you know, looking, when we're looking at longitudinal data, I think it's important um, to also look at kind of the, the longitudinal course of a disease. So I'm thinking of, you know, chronic diseases like asthma, which is what we primarily work in, is that the important time is really the, um, oh, I'm sorry, it's my cat. Um, the exacerbation period, you know, when someone is actually an active disease as opposed to, um, you know, someone with something like asthma, who for the most part, at least what we found in our omic studies, are pretty similar to um, a quote unquote healthy person, except for that period of exacerbation. So I think um, it's useful to try and capture um, those particular periods within a disease rather just than just considering people as kind of either healthy or diseased. Um, and I think as well, to go back to Ted's um, presentation from earlier, I think the concept of endotypes um, of diseases is really important um, and something that I think moving forward um, would be really good to consider for most diseases because so few diseases are really, you know, a homogeneous disease state. There are um, mechanistically different subtypes within those, um, within those diseases, which I think are important to um, study. Great, thank you. Nathan and then Tess. Yeah, I was just coming back to the earlier comments around, you know, there there are, um, you know, certainly big studies for centenarians, the longevity consortium at NIA, uh, which I used to be a part of, you know, it does a lot of those kinds of studies. And then I'll just follow up a little on what, what Mike said as well, which is, you know, you can certainly age healthier, but there is no, at least at the moment, no aging without disease. So big, big studies certainly that focus on on healthy aging. Obviously, I have a whole company called Longevity now, so I, I'm, I'm very interested in that. But it's like, um, you know, if as we as we get into that, you absolutely will see these disease transitions. And as a tool brought up, you know, the All of Us program is probably, you know, underutilized by a lot of us because you absolutely need as much um, multi-omic longitudinal data as possible. And it was brought up this before, and I'll just share my point of view really quickly, which is that if you compare the challenge of trying to reverse engineer the human body and how much dense data we have, we have a minuscule amount compared to it. And these longitudinal multi-omic data sets, you can go back to analysis over and over and over and over again. This, this set that we developed, I just can't tell you how many times we have an interesting question and we have an answer the next day because we have 5,000 people with longitudinal multi-omic data. And as we expand that, I think the number of questions that'll be possible to answer, especially as it's opened up with for lots of researchers, it's really an incredible opportunity. So I'll just say that. Thanks, uh, Tess. Uh, th thank you, uh, I, uh, uh, Russia uh, address uh, some of my questions as well. This, it may be more of disease specific, but uh, seasonality in, in terms of asthma, you know, the pollen, where is the pollen season or the mold season, the indoor air pollution, uh, all of those are really critical factors, including, you know, th there is a uh, study inner city versus, you know, those kind of uh, uh, factors actually contribute a lot than just uh, the omics. So uh, I think the risk specific environmental factors that, you know, the, the built environment are critically relevant to uh, in, in our, in this, in this area. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Tess. So let's get three last comments very briefly and then five minutes for NHGRI to wrap up. So Ji Hong, Tuli, and Bin. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to um, uh, talk about um, the uh, longitudinal um, and data. So I think there's a lot of advantages using longitudinal design, but in the meantime, there are a lot of challenges. In, uh, so I spent my first 10 years of my career working on longitudinal data analysis, um, method development and application. So one thing is, if you think about UK Bio Bank data, even the sample size is a half million, and, uh, but the number of cases of any given disease is, is small. And uh, so, for example, if you look at the lung cancer cases, only about 2,000 cases. And so, therefore, when we design the multi-omic study, we have to be smart. And uh, so, if we do random sampling, then we, for any given diseases, we can uh, end up with a very small number of people with omic data. So, therefore, I think for the first bullet point, I would like to say not only application of omic data, but also design of omic studies. 
and in longitudinal in the cohort study. And the, the second thing I want to mention is that many of the current GWA study or whole genome sequencing study or omic study mainly focus on case control designs. So given the longitudinal study that provide us new opportunity and to look at the genetic underpinning of the age at diagnosis. And uh, so they basically look at the survival data. And so it would be useful we can leverage those uh, information that is particularly helpful to identify early onset of diseases, genetic underpinning of early onset of diseases. And uh, so the third part is it's uh, longitudinal analysis had many unique challenges, in particular, like a dropout. And uh, so like if one just ignore missing data and ignore the mechanism of dropping out, and uh, then the analysis will be likely to be misleading. So one need to take into account the different missing data mechanism, for example, whether it's missing at random, not missing at random, and incorporate statistical tool to properly address the missing data mechanism. So in order to make omic analysis valid. Thank you. Uh, Tuli? Yeah, I wanted to very quickly uh, uh, raise the point that I talked about uh, yesterday, which is biospecimens. So like a solid, at least one third of the things that are on this list are now kind of something that would be only applicable to plot because that's the only biospecimen that can be currently collected at scale. And that is obviously like there are important practical considerations here, but I think this is something where we should try to push the boundaries and think about what can one do with highly scalable, non-invasive sampling of non-blood non tissues? What can we do with biopsies from in hospital settings? Uh, can we have better actually highly scalable IPSC differentiation protocols? Like, like the, we can do better than plot if, if we actually put effort into, into that. And I think it's going to be tremendously important if we actually want to apply these insights into diverse diseases and, and understand more diverse biology. Yeah, I think connecting diversity with IPSCs is a no brainer. Ben? Uh, yeah, I think we probably need a proper validation strategies, uh, either in clinical or in vitro vivo to validate uh, either mechanisms or biomarkers at a scale. So the outcomes will be used to help um, refine or Im improve the methodologies for integrating multi omics. Because we know that uh, integration omics normally can give you like a tens of thousands of hypotheses. So um, it's hard to um, test each of them. We have to have a proper strategies to validate. So I don't know, Howard, do you wanna make any comments? Uh, I've been trying to like read three different locations simultaneously <laughs> uh, before we hand it over to NHGRI to close. Yeah, so thank you everybody for all this great input and ideas. Um, I love to hear from NHGRI folks to hear whether they have something prepared, whether we have enough time to actually um, have a sort of another round of discussion. Um, one of the, um, uh, any thoughts? Um, I, I think Howard, if, if you wanted to take two, two to three more minutes, um, we will have just one minute of closing thoughts. Okay. Yeah. So I think that actually it turns out that I was looking um, at um, some, um, some sort of prior meeting records and it turns out that in 2017, um, a number of the uh, investigators funded by the Center of Excellence in Genomic Science, which is another NHGI program, actually got together and we had a workshop and we actually proposed a set of recommendations for the field of epigenomics in precision health. Now, epigenomics is obviously one slice of the multi-omics, but I've been, uh, so then that was published in Nature Biotechnology in 2017. And so then uh, I think that maybe now, you know, three, four years later, it's actually interesting to look back and, and see what we, what we proposed and what was, you know, potentially what has been done and what remains a, a ongoing need. So if I may, I'm going to try to share my screen and try to pull that up. Okay, I hope you can all see that. And so this was the... Uh, this was the, the recommendation that, that was published. Uh, and I'm just gonna focus on the figure. 
Okay. So uh, the, these are some of the challenges that we're discussing, including your needs for standards and the time. And I think this is still true. There are multiple uh, technologies being developed for epigenomics, and that is certainly true for, for multiomics. And we then said that, well, perhaps then there should be some sort of standard, either spike in or standard or cell line or cell system where different technologies would be also be always be implemented on that cell system. If you're going to collect a large cohort data set, you must also uh, repeat your, your analysis or assay on that same sort of standard. And that makes it possible to compare across different studies. At the time, one of the, the suggestions was to use one of the ENCODE tier one cell line, for example, the lymphoblastoid cell line, because we know like we have a huge amount of measurements information about, about that cell line. I think this remains a valid uh, sort of idea. I think that if we're talking about new uh, multi-omic technologies, either single cell or uh, whatever uh, new analysis pipeline scan, or we're going to use it as scale across patient cohorts, we still need standards to know that, uh, you know, batch, batch correction, different variation, that these different studies can be compared. But I would add to that recommendation, that is that, that, G, that rather than using a single line, like the tier one cell line, we should take advantage of the additional resource in the HapMap project and have more ancestry diversity, uh, gender diversity, uh, because I think this would really enhance, the, you could implement that idea about diversity into the standards that we put into our, te into our technologies. The second recommendation was about standard computational pipelines. We heard certainly a lot about the importance of integration, data integration and data analyses. The third recommendation was actually, this is specific to the epigenomics, a, a database of regulatory elements. And that actually, I think is already being done by the ENCODE consortium. So that is a, uh, uh, one check off off the list. Uh, so uh, I would love to hear uh, so, so some some feedbacks or reactions to uh, to this set of ideas. Sounds good. <laughs> 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 Having references, no, I mean you could also add age diversity, I suppose, to all this too. Right. <clears throat> I can chime in, Howard. I, I think the cell lines are fine, but of course, for identifying having reference tissues more complex you know, identification of regulatory elements that are going to be more relevant for SNPs uh, right. is going to be key. Right. So benchmarking against some standard tissue, I think, would be a, a useful. Right. Yeah. The, the challenge there is that you need, you need this resource to be kind of like self-renewing and inexhaustible, right? Because you're going to eventually use it up and then, uh, then, then what happens to that, to that standard? Sure. I think it's definitely worth going back to that 2017 and not repeating and making sure we're advancing from 2017. Yes. And I want to add that both Mike and Joe Ecker were part of the 2017 recommendation. So thank you again, uh, both for, for your input. Howard and Judy, uh, we really can't thank the two of you enough for co-chairing this workshop and also to the entire planning committee. We got a chance to get to know some of you better and you were all just fantastic. And um, before I just sort of give a few logistics to wrap up, I wanted to see if Dr. Green wanted to say anything. No, I wanted to just echo my own things. I've um, tuned in bits and pieces, but listened to the last hour in particular, and we're, we're getting a tremendous amount of feedback. Now the hard part is for us to synthesize it and really strategize both internally and with you know various advisory groups, including our advisory council, on exactly what what an initiative might look like or what what sort of the next steps should be in, in thinking about the possible development of initiative. But you know, you've given us tremendous amounts to think about. So I can certainly promise you we'll have significant amounts of internal discussion. We'll follow. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, so uh, I put in the chat that we will follow up um, in a couple weeks with a draft workshop report, uh, potentially get some additional feedback on these recommendations at the end. I think we're firing on all cylinders and got a great list of things together. And also we just, we couldn't close without thanking again, our entire AV and communications team for all the work they did. And I wanted to give a special shout out to Joanella Morales and Marie Brennan and Lori Finley, who really did the lion's share of the work pulling this all together. So thank you all. Have a wonderful weekend. And we will um, we'll let you know as soon as this information is available on genome.gov. Thanks all. Happy Juneteenth.
Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Aaron. Bye.